Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As in the previous uh, lectures uh, of this series, the lecturer has very kindly consented uh, to answer questions that you may have at the close of the lecture. And for this purpose, uh, cards I have, I believe, uh, been distributed to you, and these will be collected subsequently. Uh, at the close of the lecture, we will take a 10-minute break uh, for a little rest, and especially for the lecturer's rest, and then we shall return uh, for the uh, question period. It gives me pleasure on behalf of the Extension Division and the Committee on Public Lectures uh, to present an old friend and colleague, uh, Eric Bentley, whose name is, I'm sure, well known to many of you. Uh, he was trained at Oxford as an undergraduate, where he took his BA and his B. Lit. He took his PhD at Yale in 1941, and then taught uh, here at UCLA uh, before the war. He has taught subsequently at Black Mountain College, at the University of Minnesota, where for a time he replaced Robert Penn Warren, at Harvard as the Norton Professor of Poetry, and he has been since 1953 the Brander's Math uh, Brander Matthews uh, Professor of Dramatic Literature at Columbia. <laughs> From 1952 uh, to 1956, uh, he was the dramatic critic of the New Republic, and he gained a wide audience uh, at that time. But he is known for much more than dramatic criticism, and I refer also uh, to his translations, uh, notably perhaps those of The Good Woman of Setsuan and the Caucasian Chalk Circle, and by these he contributed notably to the establishment of Bertolt Brecht as a living force in the English-speaking theater. His anthologies of drama have been widely adopted and have been very influential. I name only a few. From the modern repertoire, the modern theater, and most recently, I think, the uh, classic theater. Finally, uh, Dr. Bentley is the author of a good many vigorous and searching books uh, on the drama, contemporary and older drama, beginning with his book, The Playwright as Thinker, in 1946, George Bernard Shaw in 1947, a very delightful volume, in Search of Theater, 1953, The Dramatic Event, 1954, and What is Theater, 1956. Thus it is with much pleasure that uh, I present to you uh, Dr. Bentley speaking on the subject of what Shakespeare has meant to succeeding ages. Dr. Bentley. <laughs> Professor Dick, ladies and gentlemen, when I was an undergraduate, I read a book called What Karl Marx Really Meant. In it, I was told that Karl Marx did not mean what people had taken him to mean. He really meant something which would now be established by the erudition and intelligence of the author of what Karl Marx really meant. I'm not telling this story to score a point off the author of what Karl Marx really meant. He was one of my teachers. I respected him then, and I respect his memory now. What he was doing is only what scholars and critics generally do, and rightly so. If there is a certain presumption in setting the whole world straight in this way, it is a presumption inherent in the calling of a critic or scholar. He must claim 
to be able to cut through stupidity and error to reason and truth, presumption or no presumption. However, if intellectual A maintains his own rightness against the world, it is legitimate for intellectual B to inquire if this rightness is as right as it says, and if the world was as uniformly stupid and wrong as it may have been represented to be. Sometimes a historian, such as Edmund Burke, can convince us that there was more wisdom in the alleged errors of the world than in the supposedly proven truths of individual thinkers. You may wonder, perhaps, why I raise this point in a talk on Shakespeare. It is because critics of Shakespeare attempt to establish what Shakespeare really meant, and some even urge quite strongly that they have established it, and they become quite shrill sometimes at the expense of the alleged errors of their predecessors. And I would say of them what I have just implied of historians of ideas generally, namely that up to a point they are entitled to stand up for themselves against all comers, but that they should also be willing to explore the alleged errors of the past without this hostility. Actually, I believe the exploration to be much more necessary in the case of literature than of ideas. For while it may perhaps be possible to isolate an idea and see it in all its purity, I do not believe that a work of art can be so isolated or so seen. In his book on art and illusion, Professor Gombrich has shown that the same drawing will be seen as different objects according to what the viewer has just been told about it. Do you see what this proves about drawings? That they cannot be defined in wholly objective terms because a decisive factor is the expectation in the mind of the viewer. Now expectations play a similar role in the other arts, which explains why art that is original beyond a certain point simply cannot be assimilated at first by its audience. The special qualities of a sonnet, for example, can be appreciated only by persons who have certain expectations as to meter and rhyme. They even have to expect it to have 14 lines. Otherwise, the poet's use of this particular pattern will not be appreciated. A poem that just happened to stop after 14 lines would not be a sonnet. We speak of an audience bringing something to a play, but only if we have gone rather deeply into the whole psychology of art do we realize how much an audience brings to a play. And there is one fact which, though simple and obvious, we often overlook. A work of art, a work of literary art, is not black marks on a page. A poem is not a list of words that are adequately summed up in the dictionary. Each work of art began as an experience and has existed since only as other experiences. The experience is of an audience, together at one time or, or not. Where is Hamlet? It was once in the mind of Shakespeare, and it has since been in the minds of many others, including you and me. It is not in the book, even when the book is the first folio. The historical scholar, who has by now caught the drift of what I'm saying, might want to interject at this point. This is all very well, and even undeniable, but we have not claimed to find the meaning of Hamlet in black marks in any book. Rather, by an effort of imagination, as well as memory and intelligence, we have tried to find out what the play must have meant originally. I ask the historical scholar, 
in the mind of Shakespeare. And some historical scholars, if they are honest, may say yes at that point. Mr. A. L. Rouse, for instance, writes as one who has had Shakespeare on the telephone. <laughs> I would only interject that those who claim to enter the mind of Shakespeare under the impression that that is pure history are practicing self-deception. To, uh, to pretend to enter the mind of Shakespeare is really to indulge in speculation. Perhaps the motive is simply to find for one's own small opinions a large authority that they may not deserve. But there are historical critics of greater sophistication than this, and they will retort to me, the mind of Shakespeare, of course not. We're thinking of his first audience. From the study of, Elizab from the study of Elizabethan times, we can tell you that such an interpretation of Shakespeare, uh, such and such an interpretation of Shakespeare, would have been inconceivable in the year 1600, while such and such, on the other hand, would readily have commanded itself as what Shakespeare really meant. Here we come to the issue on which there is the strongest difference of opinion. The historical scholar has tended to wish to limit the interpretation of Shakespeare to presumed interpretations of the first audience, meaning by the first audience, the one of 1590, 1600, 1610. A Freudian interpretation of Hamlet would accordingly be rejected on the grounds that Shakespeare had not read Freud, nor had his audience. A more sophisticated v version of this is that a Freudian interpretation is wrong because such ways of thought are in their v character, un-Elizabethan. There is a sophisticated answer to this, though. It is that historical criticism is also very un-Elizabethan. <laughs> and therefore, that there is inevitably an enormous gap between the mind of a modern scholar thinking himself back to the year 1600 and the mind of the actual spectators in any conceivable globe theater. But here I am again implying that the mind of the audience is important, and the historical scholar generally assumes that it isn't. I realize I'm raising questions of interpretation that imply, that apply to not just to Shakespeare, but to all literature and to all art. And I shall not get down to the discussion of Shakespeare unless I quickly state my own position. And rather than call it my own, I should acknowledge rather that certain scholars have formulated an answer to the accepted position which I am fully accepting. One of these is one of another of my old teachers, Lassels Abercrombie, who in 1930 brought what he called a plea for the liberty of interpreting, and he was speaking of Shakespeare, incidentally, a plea for the liberty of interpreting before the British Academy. He said, I do not mean liberty, I do not mean liberty to read into a play of Shakespeare's whatever feeling or idea a modern reader may loosely and accidentally associate with the subject. But I do mean that anything which may be found in that art, even if it is only the modern reader who can find it there, may legitimately be taken as its meaning. A French critic, Aurelia Weiss, has written a whole book on this subject under the title Le Destin des Grandes Oeuvres Dramatiques, The Destiny of the Great Dramatic Works. He writes, I translate literally, a dramatic work has only the value and the meaning which each generation of readers or spectators can lend to it. What would be the effect and the fate of drama without the active collaboration of the spectators, without the development, the interpretation, and the meaning which they must give to it. The theatrical work of the past, which triumphs in the present, becomes a work of our time by virtue of an inevitable process of adaptation." Unquote. <coughs> it is proper that within limits, 
Hamlet should be different in each generation. What is improper is to dismiss the Hamlets of former generations as based on inadequate knowledge or, or inadequate intelligence and to claim to be able to state now, at last, what Shakespeare really meant. Some people write patronizingly of Dr. Johnson's view of Shakespeare, or Goethe's, or Coleridge's. But if the modern scholar has any advantage over them, it is just the kind of advantage he is least likely to claim. Each person, scholar or not, enjoys the advantage of his own particular vantage point, angle of vision, and no other. There are things about Shakespeare, in other words, which are visible in 1964, which may not have been visible in 1760. What we forget is that the converse is also true. The 18th century had its point of vantage. I see this as exactly like looking at a physical object, like a mountain or a building, that you, you look only from one side and you see things which the people looking at the other side don't see but then the reverse of that is also true. To admit that the 20th century has some natural advantages goes against the scholar's grain since he is trained only to help his students counteract whatever may be the disadvantages of the present. Actually, if the scholar could give up as an illusion the notion that he would ever attain the point of view of the original audience, he would then be free to accept whatever may be the advantages of the 20th century angle of vision. And so he might help us to see more from this angle. Changing the metaphor a little from eyes to spectacles, we see with our own spectacles. I'm saying that scholarship should not deprive us of these since it can offer in exchange only frames without lenses. But I'm not trying to deprive historical scholarship of a function. I think it can guide our vision somewhat if it accepts our spectacles, not to mention our eyes. What Shakespeare really meant is known only to God and will be. And even God, if he is a philosopher, will toss the proposition back at us and ask, what do you mean by really? <laughs> what Shakespeare has meant, which is the title of my talk tonight, not sh what Shakespeare has meant in successive ages necessarily, but what Shakespeare has meant in successive ages, yes, but also what he has meant in your life or in mine, is a matter of history. And the poet's 400th birthday is a good time to recall it. The phrase what Shakespeare has meant itself contains at least three distinct meanings. First, there is the meaning of each phrase and line of Shakespeare, that part of the whole which we try to pin down in footnote and paraphrase. Second, there is what we take it, Shakespeare was, as we put it, trying to say his view of things, what the Germans call the Weltanschauung, the themes of his plays, the outlook that goes with them. And third, there is all that is implied when we say how much Shakespeare means to us. In this talk, I shall ignore the first of these three meanings of the word meaning, but shall have constantly in mind the second and the third. And I would suggest they are linked in this way. Shakespeare can mean a lot to us only if he is in touch with what already means a lot to us. Again, I would stress all that we bring to Shakespeare. He means a lot to us because his themes are the themes of our lives. The special appeal of great drama, I would put in parenthetically, <clears throat> is that its conflicts are the quintessential conflicts of life as it is lived. The life of both the spirit and the passions finds in the drama a uniquely concentrated and vivid representation. So it would seem this art, a vacuous art to a creature without spirit or without passion. 
but it is no less vacuous to a human being who sets aside his humanity and tries to see it without recourse to his own spirit and his own passion. Objectivity here would mean vacuity. In short, one interprets Shakespeare with all one has got, on the one hand with all one has got of erudition and historical sense, and on the other with all one has got of experience and of personal identity. I interpret Shakespeare, and you, and he, but less so we and they. I wish this evening to offer three brief interpretations which I hope are neither immodest nor modest. In other words, I've not tried to keep myself out of them, but I must hope that I have not intruded myself so much that what I say has little relevance for others. The subjects of these interpretations are three. First, poetic drama, second, tragedy, and third, tragic comedy. The questions I shall address myself to are, how does the poetic drama of Shakespeare differ from the poetic drama as we have known it later, as well as from prose drama? Second, what is the view of life found in Shakespearean tragedy, or at least in what I believed to be the greatest of the tragedies, King Lear. Third, what is the special message, as it would seem today, of Shakespeare's tragic comedies and especially Measure for Measure? What is poetic drama my first, on my first theme? Drama that is poetry differs from the two kinds of drama we are most familiar with. These are, first, drama that is conversation, and second, drama that is elevated rhetoric. The difference between Shakespeare and the modern conversational uh, drama is obvious enough. What is the difference between Shakespeare and good rhetorical drama, such as Schiller's Mary Stuart? A rhetorician takes the language as it is and marshals his words with all the professional skills of pulpit and law court. A case is stated and if it is stated with more than clarity and concision, then what is added might be considered flourishes of humor, of wit, of cleverness. But the poet does not regard words in this way as tools already made. They are tools he makes and remakes while using them. The rhetorician is rightly said to clothe thoughts in suitable words, and that is to imply that the thoughts already existed fully enough for us to judge that they are now suitably clothed. Now if they existed, they existed in words, presumably other words and less suitable ones. Hence the rhetorician is an improver of phraseology, a professional rewrite man. His aim is to put down what oft was thought but ne'er so well expressed. The poet, on the other hand, likes to get at a thought before it is fully a thought, before it has been pinned down with words. With him, the word finding and the thought thinking proceed together, and the result is not necessarily new vocabulary, but new language, new phrasing, new combinations of vocabulary, new rhythms, new meaning. We do not congratulate a poet on putting it well, but rather on producing a new it to put. For English-speaking persons, the great instance of fully poetic drama is inescapably Shakespeare. Ben Jonson's tragedies are comparatively rhetorical, the tragedies of the Restoration even more so. Even John Webster's claim to have created a fully poetic drama in this sense is dubious. He is rather the creator of poetic drama in the modern sense of a drama in highly colored language. I've spoken of the poet as making up his language as he goes along. Today such a statement might suggest the devices of Finnegan's Wake, but the Shakespearean experiment was the opposite. James Joyce will have his joke on the basis of erudition and memory. His book is an experiment to end experiments and wholly retrospective in method. Shakespeare faced forwards and could get away with it because he had the luck to live at a time when the language was unsettled and young. He helped to mold 
not only an English of his own, but the English of English culture. One hardly needs the Oxford Dictionary to confirm that so many expressions are first found in Shakespeare. One has, while reading him, so lively and spontaneous a sense of being present at the very birth of meaning. Philosophically, there are in Shakespeare's works reiterations of older views, but the experiencing of the philosophers is forever new in him. This is one reason why Shakespeare means more to us than those who would teach us more. He takes us back to a point before that at which teachings are formulated. He does not contend or confute. He enables us to melt down our contentions and confutations after which we can, if we are capable of it, remold them for ourselves. His spiritual strength is unique because he is the teacher behind the teachers. The most obvious characteristic of the Shakespearean style and method is rich and original imagery. All writing contains images, but the images of rhetoric are only those of conversation worked up with a fuller vocabulary and better rhythm. That is to say, they are old images, which the rhetorician uses again with more or less of an acknowledgement of the fact. Even what he would call his new images are still old. Either it will be found that they have been used before, or they represent so slight a departure from the old as to enforce no new way of seeing the object. Orators no doubt think of metaphors, think as we say of metaphors and similes, but what metaphors and similes they think of is a matter of habit helped out by logic. Their kind of imagery is merely illustrative, and we can all think of such images insofar as we are not dim-witted. The difference between Shakespeare and, for example, Schiller is in nothing so marked as in their use of images. Shakespeare does in this line all that, sh sorry, <coughs> Schiller does in this line all that a good orator can do, but Shakespeare thinks in images. It is by means of the image, more than any other single <coughs> method one can readily name, that he comes by his uniquely fresh vision of things. Our difficulty is only in keeping pace with him. The images say so much and shift so rapidly, one could not possibly take it all in at a first hearing. Even to observe the main pattern, let alone notice the details, one has to go more slowly than any actor ever could. In this because, is this because some of the words are now archaic? Is it because we are less quick in apprehension than our Elizabethan ancestors? Whatever the reason, one characteristic result of the failure is that producers of his plays feel compelled to simplify him. And rather than slow the dialogue down to the point where it might be clear, but would probably be tiresome, they maintain a proper tempo and sacrifice all the details. Now, from a speech delivered too fast to follow in detail, one retains just certain general impressions, broad ideas. From the Shakespearean point of view, that is not enough. No wonder comparison with a rhetorician like Schiller becomes possible, for under these conditions, Shakespeare may well be a Schiller, his poetry having been reduced in performance to rhetoric. And there are those who seem to say so much the better. When a Shakespeare play is read thus loosely, not only are its, significant, are, are its specific meanings missed, but the way is open to any loose interpretation that may take anyone's fancy. And these we see in all the modern, in, modern productions of Shakespeare, which are said to have some original idea in them. In the edition of Twelfth Night, for instance, which commemorates Orson Welles' production, we learn that the play has a thesis, and that the thesis is this, Dost thou think, because thou art virtuous, there shall be no more cakes and ale? Which is as though the play had been written by Sir Toby Belch. <laughs> and it seems that when Orson Welles staged, staged Julius Caesar, he made fascists and anti-fascists out of Caesar's party and their enemies respectively. This kind of interpretation would seem to yield political drama of a type positively inferior to Schiller, 
because since fascists are bad and anti-fascists good ex officio, it cannot be so very interesting to get to know either party. All we have is a crude melodrama made pretentious by forced allusions to current events. Now poetry can include conversation and rhetoric. In Shakespeare there are naturalistic or conversational bits and there are rhetorical bits like say the French dramatist Corneille but the poetic dramatist does not limit himself to those kinds of appeal. Even Corneille and Schiller seem narrow when compared with Shakespeare. The rhetorical drama tends to limit them to the public and professional side of life. Using a homiletic and forensic type of dialogue, they present a cast of characters who, if they're not all preachers and lawyers, live in the world of preachers and lawyers, the world of public issues. Shakespeare does not belittle the public issues, but his universality consists not least in this, that he presents the inner life of man, not instead of, but as well as, the outer life. Shakespeare's image of man, to use the current phrase, requires, among other things, lyrical verse to define it. How inconceivable that anyone should sing a little love song in a play by Corneille. It, it would be breaking with more than the classical unities, it would be breaking with his world. Influenced by Schiller and the Greeks, influenced by Shakespeare and the Greeks, Schiller very much wished to introduce lyrical elements into his plays, but his kind of lyric is itself rhetorical, and when his Mary Stuart burst into stanzaic verses after two acts of iambic pentameter, the sense of change is very slight. In Shakespeare, on the other hand, the presence of little songs here and there is a token of an omnipresent lyricism that goes to the making of the Shakespearean verse texture throughout the Shakespearean dramaturgy and even the Shakespearean world view. I'm going on now to my second topic of tragedy. In King Lear we find these two propositions. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. And also, the gods are just, and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. Our first inclination, if we read this play as schoolboys, as many of us have, is to be so struck with the first proposition, the one about the flies and the wanton boys, and so bowled over by the horrors in the story, that we conclude this must obviously be the theme of the play. It has often been cited as such by people older than schoolboys. When, however, we get to the university, we are confronted with scholars who demolish this schoolboy interpretation with erudition, professional efficiency, and a certain amount of glee. Filling in the background of Elizabethan thought and proving beyond a doubt that England was a Christian country, even a Protestant one, they conclude that what we have here is a Christian, even a Protestant play that justifies the ways of God to man. At this point, it occurs to me that we must beware of steeping authors in their time so thoroughly that they drown. Even more than he represents other people, a poet is himself. I'm not saying that Shakespeare was a man of unorthodox views and militant te temperament. I think King Lear could be read as a justification of the gods. But even if Shakespeare came back to earth and endorsed this reading, I would say there is always an appeal from the philosophy of a play to its spirit, and there is always an appeal from an author's intentions to his works. It is likely enough that Shakespeare saw himself as giving a Christian answer to the problem of evil. To try to give any other answer in a public theater, which is the sort of thing historians delight to point out, would have been a fantastic proceeding at that date. The question is, does the play, as against the one line quoted, bear this interpretation? 
the one line about the gods being just. I think the answer has to be found not in skillful quotation, skillfully chosen, here and there, but in the plot and the characters and the interrelationship of many, many lines. My feeling is that Shakespeare is here disturbed by all the suffering and evil in the world and that the play is far from embodying a quiet faith in the Christian attempt to explain and justify the universe. If I'm right, behind the opposition of the quoted lines, an opposition of rival views, is another opposition, that between having and not having views. The validity of human understanding, Christian or otherwise, seems to me to be questioned. Shakespeare has seen so much, one might put it, that he is staggered. All he achieves by way of affirmation, it would seem to me, is to seize terror by the hand, a phrase from Rilke, to seize terror by the hand and recover sufficiently from that dizziness to be able to write a play. It is a case of vertigo recollected in tranquility. I should have had an easier time taking Racine as an example of this point. Racine wrote tragedies in conscious rebellion from his church. The Shakespeare pheno Shakespearean phenomenon is more complex. What it means, I think, is that Shakespearean tragedy cannot be contained within any philosophy whatsoever. It is not even existentialist. It is only existential. What the Restoration did to Shakespeare was precisely to accommodate him to a philosophy. The happy ending that they wrote to King Lear makes sense. Sense is what it makes. Shakespeare's play does not make sense in that sense. Sense is what it does not make. It is the image of the nonsensical life we live and the nonsensical death we die. Only Samuel Johnson, with his prodigious candor, lets us know the real reasons the 18th century had for preferring Dr. Shakespeare. Shakespeare, he says, is, in effect, is too painful. One cannot stand it. It is clear from Dr. Johnson's remarks that neoclassic theories are but a rationalization of the fear of the anxiety raised by Shakespeare. King Lear is a play to arouse anxiety. It pierces the armor of our ideas, and even of Shakespeare's ideas I am maintaining, and strikes to the heart. The disturbance is in the springs of pathos a phrase from Meredith writing on the subject of tragedy, a disturbance in the springs of pathos. Should we generalize from this instance and say that great tragedy simply disturbs and that the disturbance is never transcended? I'm really having in the back of my mind here two theories of tragedy, one according to which it shows a transcendence of suffering and the other according to which the presentation of the suffering or disturbance would be enough. Should we generalize and say that great tragedy simply disturbs and that the disturbance is not transcended? That would be nearer the truth, in my opinion, than the view, perhaps dominant in, up to now in the 20th century, that tragedy is directly positive, even optimistic. And yet, even in Lear, even in Lear, as I have just tried to interpret it, there is a kind of transcendence, namely the transcendence implied by the power to write the play. But Shakespeare transcended his suffering in writing King Lear. This, I think, is, should be called the only kind of transcendence which the tragic poet can promise. It is not necessarily the only one he supplies. And it is therefore the kind that belongs to our minimum demand on his services. Tragedy embodies an experience of chaos, and the only cosmos which the tragic poet can guarantee to offset it with is the cosmos of his tragedy, with its integration of plot, character, dialogue, and idea. The French critic Touchard has a simple phrase for the phenomenon tragedy. Chanson, um, he calls it a song of despair, chanson de désespoir. 
The thought is an exquisite paradox because despair does not sing. If a despairing man starts to sing, he has already transcended his despair. Now my third topic, which is tragic comedy. Regarding a tragic comedy, the so-called problem plays of Shakespeare in his middle period, plays like Measure for Measure, and the so-called romances, which were his last plays, aside from possibly Henry VIII. And here I turn more to the topic of the subject matter, the material used, not in the sense of plot, but in the sense of theme. Particularly, Shakespeare's continuation after King Lear to explore his own experience of revenge, justice, forgiveness. The touch of forgiveness at the end of Lear, or the touch of forgiveness even in the middle of Lear when uh, Cordelia forgives her father in the great scene, no cause, no cause. This has been seen by scholars, rightly I think, as leading into the final Shakespeare, so-called as leading into the treatment of reconciliation in the winter's tale and the tempest and so on. So I want to, us to think for a moment about Shakespeare's treatment of this ultimate human theme, revenge, justice, forgiveness. It is possible to see life and to live life as nothing but a series of revenges. Very early on, we acquire the feeling of having been being wronged, of having been wronged. We can then spend the rest of our time on earth trying to get our own back. We begin by punishing our siblings. In adolescence, we can punish our parents. In our twenties, we can accept marriage as a device for the continuation of punishment till death us do part. <laughs> Divorce can be shunned by some people because it permits an interruption of punishment <laughs> and welcomed by others because it permits remarriage and the resumption of punishment with renewed relentlessness. Education, until recently, permitted the punishment of pupils by teachers, and now it permits the punishment of teachers by pupils. <laughs> Under both systems, the younger children are punished by the older. The products of education compose what we call human society. Human society is designed for punishment on the grander scale, by poverty, by strikes, by law courts, by concentration camps and prisons, by the noose, the axe, the gas chamber, the electric chair, and above all, by war. That is stating the proposition in the grandest terms. We could state it in day-to-day -day terms. The tone of voice of a New York bus driver, there don't seem to be any buses in Los Angeles, so I haven't been able to explore this. The tone of voice of the New York bus driver bespeaks a life solemnly dedicated to the proposition that one must get one's own back at all costs. Every hour of every day and in relation to every human being encountered. Now, since a bus driver encounters half a dozen people a minute, at least in that city, he can amass a number of victims beyond the wildest hopes of any villain of melodrama. <laughs> Getting one's own back, taking revenge, inflicting punishment for real or imagined wrongs, this has good title to be considered the principal activity of the species Homo sapiens. Somewhat less obvious is the circumstance that the idea of revenge is not nearly as welcome to mankind as the reality. Though taking revenge may be what we chiefly do, it also happens to be what we chiefly deplore. We always have to pretend that our revenges are not revenges, they are equitable punishment. Not that even punishment is quite reputable, but it almost becomes so when it is believed to be deserved. Hence justice as we now know it, whether in private life 
or in the law courts is pure fraud, a mere rationalization of vindictiveness. To say that justice as we know it is a fraud is to say that it is not justice, but it is not to say that true justice has never played any part in human history. I'm willing to postulate not only a passion for revenge, but even a passion for justice. The misfortune being for the world being that the passion for justice does not show itself either as often or as strongly. Though measures making for justice are not unknown to history, all the societies known to history are radically unjust. Much the same could be said about the individual realm, with the happy difference that here acts of justice are more numerous, more frequent, I should perhaps say. Many people, indifferent to justice in the great world, attach importance to it in their family and their personal circle. There is a circumstance less obvious. Although there has been so little of justice in human affairs, and nothing approaching a just society has ever been seen on earth, the imagination of mankind has been able to figure forth, and the conscience of mankind has been able to accept a yet loftier idea. This is forgiveness. Mutual forgiveness of each vice. Such are the gates of paradise. William Blake is telling us in these lines what it could be most valuable for human beings to know. But in fact, the gates of paradise remain closed because we have not proved able as a species or even often as individuals to act on that kind of knowledge. How should we practice forgiveness when we have not even managed to practice justice? Yet the idea of forgiveness is instructive if only in reminding us that justice will never be enough. Better than revenge, justice is itself primitive. It is the principle expressed in the lex talionis, a Latin phrase of which the best translation is to make the punishment fit the crime. A man has stolen $100. When caught, he will be fined $100. That is the famous eye for an eye principle of the Old Testament. Brought up in Christian schools, I was always told that that principle was one of pure revenge. That's a slander on Judaism, but I'll give my teachers the benefit of the doubt and assume they may have dimly sensed that there was something dubious about justice. To be forever matching offenses with equivalent punishments is no good way to spend one's time. Much less is it a good way for God to spend eternity. A truly superior being would utter the word forgiveness with an immense sigh, not only of love but of relief. So much effort would he be saving himself at the adding machine. <laughs> Actually, he did utter that word in the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 19. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart, thou shalt not take vengeance, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But Leviticus is, head, is ahead of the believers in the New Testament, uh, who in the theater as elsewhere, are ever on the lookout for revenge. What, for example, are plays about? Plays are about action and reaction. A slaps B's face and B slaps A's face back. This is the basis of the art of the drama. The root idea of plot is nothing more than tit for tat or injury and in retaliation. In farce, that idea is given a free rein and is defensible on the grounds that at least it is harmless, since it takes place in what anybody but a madman can recognize as pure fantasy. And at most it might be useful, since it affects a catharsis on a, in a small way, and works some of our aggressions out of our system, as the psychologist now put it. The value of melodrama resides in the candid acceptance of fantasies and full-bodied feelings, especially fantasies and feelings of fear. And how do melodramas end? In all conventional melodrama, of the modern period at least, the villain we fear so much is finally punished. The lily-white hero and heroine get their own back. And therefore, so do we, the audience. Images of fear are canceled by images of exquisite vengeance. 
Seldom is this admitted, though, as in life, so in melodrama, we pretend our revenges are equitable punishments. Melodrama is neurotic. It is a neurotic habit to collect injustices in that way and take for granted that injustice is something that others do to me, not I to them. What I bestow upon them is deserved punishment. Melodrama reflects this little scheme. If the Avengers of the Victorian melodramatic stage at first seemed remote, wrapped as they are in alien rhetoric and an outmoded kind of narrative, they remain symbols of what goes on daily in the lives of every man, in the life of every man. And so to proceed to tragedy and comedy is to proceed from the crude revenges of farce and, fake just, and the fake justice of melodrama to justice itself, the lex talionis. Volponi and Mosca must be arraigned and found guilty and sentenced. Portia in The Merchant of Venice preaches forgiveness but does not practice it. She has the Duke figure exactly what is the equivalent of a pound of flesh measured in what is dearest to Shylock, namely property. For half thy wealth it is Antonio's, the other half comes to the general state. To which Shylock replies with excellent sense, you take my house when you do take the prop that doth sustain my house, you take my life when you do take the means by which I live, but such is what we call comedy. How meticulous the tragic poets also are with their weights and their measures. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, reads the famous passage in the book of Exodus. And the life for life idea is taken up by the playwrights as a principle both ethical and aesthetic. Ethical because it expresses the idea of lex talionis, aesthetic because it corresponds to the drama's tit for tat. A life is taken at the beginning of a story. Restitution is made for it at the end with another life. Since Duncan's life is taken in Act Two, Macbeth's not will but must be taken in Act Five. Othello represents but a slight variation on the pattern. Desdemona's life is not taken till near the end, but it has been threatened ever since the plot got underway, and once forfeit must be paid for in the same coin, Othello must die. One cannot understand the extent to which the dramatists depart from what happens in real life until one has noticed their inordinate respect for the lex talionis. Consider, for instance, the idea of poetic justice as it has flourished in the history of the drama over long periods. It represents an extension of the lex talionis from the field of crime into that of virtue. Not only are the bad punished, in other words, but the good are rewarded the quantities again being meticulously measured upon scales of justice. There is nothing in poetic justice to stop a man writing a great play, of course, and so, uh, one scholar in the Spanish field has recently argued that it is presupposed in all the great Spanish drama. The modern dramatists, on the other hand, have objected to poetic justice and have delighted to let the malefactor go unpunished. This, however, does not mean that they care less about justice and have rejected the Lex Talionis. By showing justice outraged, they hope to outrage the audience and fan the passion for justice into flame. The old approach was conservative. In Lope de Vega's play Fuente Avejuna, for example, justice was imposed by God and the king. The play has been modernized in the Soviet Union by simple omission of the ending. What the play then comes to mean is that justice will be done when the people take over. Understood in this way, justice can easily deteriorate into mere revenge and drama into melodrama. Marxist fighters, like other fighters, are all too eager to match the enemy's atrocities with their own. And when men enjoy carrying out the lex talionis, something has been added unto justice, namely cruelty. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. With the capitalistic oppressors in mind, Bertolt Brecht once posted up on stage the words, they do know what they do. He had a point there, 
but it is unlikely that anyone would be able to impl implement it except vindictively. The Elizabethans tried to forestall this danger. They invoked the passage from Paul's epistle to the Romans in which Paul said that revenge was not for us to take but should be left to God. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So far so good, but in this world God's vengeance must find a human instrument. And then how are we to know if a given avenger is God's instrument? It is even harder to tell if a man is God's instrument than if his motive is a passion for justice. And why does Paul use the word vengeance? What business has God with that? Is there not something dubious in Paul's attitude? Something dubious in the whole traditional attitude of the West? No one professes belief in revenge. Everyone agrees that justice is preferable and the highest teaching invites us <coughs> to think, uh, invites us to that transcendence of justice, which is forgiveness. It is vain to expect the drama or any art to stand far above the culture it belongs to. If the culture practices revenge, tempering it occasionally with a little justice, it is to be expected that that is exactly what its literature will do. This in turn explains why a truly radical man like Tolstoy may come to reject most of Western literature with most of Western society. He did stand above his culture. On the pinnacle he judged from, literature seemed barbaric like the men who wrote it and the men they wrote it for. Tolstoy included, of course, in this general indictment his own masterpieces. And why not? They show the dialectics of life as it is lived, the tit-for-tat, the battledore and shuttlecock of ordinary action and reaction. Ideals are present, just as they always are, but people fail to put them into practice, just as they always do. And anyhow, they are only ideals of justice. They fall far short of the limitless forgiveness of Christ. Shelley takes a position less defensible than Tolstoy's. He believes that we should practice forgiveness in life while retaining justice and revenge in literature. Uh, <clears throat> this is how he puts it in the preface to the, his play, The Chenchi, talking about Beatrice's heroine. Quote, the fit return to make to the most enormous injuries is kindness or forbearance and a resolution to convert the injurer from his dark passion by peace and love. Revenge, retaliation, atonement are pernicious mistakes. If Beatrice had thought in this manner, she would have been wiser and better, but she would not have made a tragic character. The few whom such an exhibition would have interested could never have been sufficiently interested for a dramatic purpose. From the want of finding sympathy in their interest among the mass surrounding them. It is in the restless and anatomizing casuistry with which men seek the justification of Beatrice yet feel that she has done what needs justification. It is in the superstitious horror with which they contemplate alike her wrongs and their revenge that the dramatic character of what she did and suffered consists." Unquote. Now it's true that the drama deals more readily with badness than with goodness, with failure than with success, as does literature in general. This is why people have found the best character in Paradise Lost to be Satan and the Inferno better reading than the Paradiso. Literature stops this side of Paradise and deals with the world, the flesh and the devil. But what Shelley overlooks, in this passage at least, is that literature reflects human interest, that is, reflects life as it is. If reality was suddenly changed in the way he proposes, the result would be that with equal suddenness, literature would be all forgiveness too. Revenge appeals to the dramatists because they are masters of reality and not ideologues. Shelley takes forgiveness and love to be inherently undramatic. He sees only the final state of beatitude, reached possibly by a forgiving saint at a supreme moment, and therefore overlooks the fact that forgiveness is achieved with difficulty, and that there is a drama in the difficulty or conflict through which it is reached. Forgiveness is an alternate reaction, to put it prosaically, to revenge. 
and can be understood, functionally speaking, as revenge is understood. Here is an account of revenge from studies of hysteria by Breuer and Sigmund Freud. The instinct of revenge, which is so powerful in the natural man and is disguised rather than repressed by civilization, is nothing but the excitation of a reflex which has not been released. To defend oneself against injury in a fight and in so doing to injure one's opponent could be called the adequate and preformed psychical reflex. If it has been carried out insufficiently or not at all, it is constantly released again by recollection and the instinct of revenge, so-called, comes into being as an irrational, volitional impulse. In other words, you become vengeful by not having taken revenge, quite a, an astute theory. By not taking revenge, one develops the habit and mentality of the vengeful. Very noticeable uh, in so many people. That is, the very absence of expression for their vengefulness has made them vengeful. Freud and Breuer envisage no third possibility, and yet there is one. It is to react using the same energy in another direction, trying to be very physiological about all this. In the spirit of forgiveness, this too could be called an adequately performed reflex. In view of his interest in nonviolent resistance, it is curious that Shelley did not agree to this. His point of view in the passage quoted is pretty much that of juvenile philistinism in America today, according to which turning the other cheek is sissy. Vengefulness actually is nothing if not a sign of diffidence, and forgiveness, far from being a sort of natural emanation of human mildness, has to be fought through to in a very arduous process, besides which hitting back is very simple. Machiavelli was right. In public life, things like forgiveness do not exist. Imagine a candidate for the Senate proposing to forgive someone, or any, uh, let alone a group or a nation. It just isn't done. Yet forgiveness enters into private life. Why? Is it not largely because each of us, weary from orgies of small revenges, small in the case of most of us, I suppose large in the case of others of us, weary from orgies of revenge, yearns to be forgiven, our very existence seems to demand not only justification but forgiveness. If the human interest in forgiveness can be attributed to no nobler source, it can be attributed to this natural or ex existential need to be justified. We wish we need to be forgiven. We are sometimes able to forgive others for no better reason than that we wish and need to be forgiven. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. It's a kind of bargain. We cannot come directly to Blake's conclusion on mutual forgiveness, but we may come to it indirectly by realizing, as Juvenal puts it, that in the verdict of his own heart, no guilty man is ever acquitted. In Hamlet, do we not find Shakespeare himself entangled in the ambiguities of Western civilization, the ambiguities of justice and revenge? The story seems basically pagan, even to the extent of accepting revenge as legitimate. Yet, the culture suggested by the Shakespearean poetry is unmistakably that of Elizabethan England, and there are many references in the play to Christian belief. I remember wondering as a boy how it could be Hamlet's duty to take revenge since the Bible says that revenge is wrong. Later on, I was told what St. Paul said about this matter, or almost about this matter, when he wrote to the Romans, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But I must confess that for Hamlet, that seemed to provide too neat an alibi. Does Hamlet ever really seem the instrument of St. Paul's God, even when he does kill his uncle? If that is Shakespeare's point, he didn't make it very clearly. Curious how many logical arguments about Hamlet would make a bad play of it. There is an unresolved ambiguity here, which is not that of the play alone, or even of William Shakespeare, but that of a whole civilization. A civilization which has never made up its mind, but has always had a double, no, a triple standard, 
preaching forgiveness while believing in justice while practicing revenge. In the Oresteia, Aeschylus described the transcendence of revenge by justice. And we reenact this transcendence when seeing or reading his play. Though Shakespeare began with revenge plays, which as I've been using the terms should be called justice plays, he went on to show the transcendence of justice by mercy. No one has missed this motif in his last romances. Prospero, instead of dealing out punishments to his enemies, except for Caliban, forgives them. Hermione, instead of getting her own back on Leontes, is reconciled with him. Even in King Lear, the motif is present. The play is not a demonstration that the gods are just for what happens is not deserved punishment. The gods may not kill us for their sport, they may kill us without even knowing it. There may even be no gods. If there is a morally positive element in the play, and I think there is, its most lovely and I would think most dramatic manifestation is Cordelia's forgiveness of her father. It is the purified love of these two that gives the ending of the play its moral beauty. Cordelia herself stood in need of forgiveness, by the way. In the opening scene, she is not only right, she is rigid. She is insistent on her rightness and unwilling to make use of any of her resources except her rightness. When she returns from France, we see a different woman. The ice has melted. Her attention is no longer focused on her own rightness. Her forgiveness is so deep it is absorbed by her love and requires no statement. The very need for it can be denied. As Leah says, I know you do not love me for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. And she replies, no cause, no cause. We are right to speak of the beauty of these lines in which there is no separable beauty of word or phrase. It is the beauty of a moral attitude that has overcome us, embedded as it is in character and action. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not here the static, inert goodness that Shelley feared. They are worked through to, fought through to, suffered through to. Neither justice nor revenge was ever more dramatic than this. That is just an aspect of King Lear, but there is one Shakespeare play, aside from the last romances, that is all about forgiveness. This is measure for measure. Lex Talionis is the subject proposed in the title and repeated at the opening of the last scene in which it will finally be repudiated and transcended. The very mercy of the law cries out most audible even from his proper tongue, an angelo for Claudio, death for death. Haste still pays haste, and leisure answers leisure, like doth quit like, and measure still for measure. Claudio is not dead. The god of this play is not one who lets a Claudio die so that the death of an Angelo can follow. Not God, but Angelo is here the champion of the Lex Talionis. Earlier in the play, Isabella advises him to forgive since he will need to be forgiven. None of us is good enough to wish justice handed out to him. How would you be if he which is the top of judgment should but judge you as you are? Oh, think on that, and mercy will then breathe within your lips like a man new made. Such is the main point of this play and its place in the main action. But the play has a double, or what I would call a dialectical action, of which the second, an antithetical part, is often overlooked. In the final scene of Measure for Measure Still, Isabel is asked to practice all she preaches. To take the Christian message so much to heart that she will plead for mercy not for her brother, whom she supposes dead, but for her enemy, whom she believes her brother's killer. Every law, except the law of sheer forgiveness, speaks against this plea. Should she kneel down in mercy of this fact, her brother's ghost, his paved bed would break and take her hands in horror. How can she do it? She is not the kneeling kind. Her virtue is of the unbending sort, like Cordelia's. 
The answer to the question is written out in the action of the play as a whole. In the beginning she could not have done it, in the end she can. As with Cordelia, ice has melted. The bristling virgin has turned into the compassionate woman. Guilty of a rigidity that could have been as fatal as Angelo's, she, like him, learns a lesson in forgiveness, as do we. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bentley. We will now take a break. The questions will be collected, and those of you who would like uh, to hear the questions and subsequent discussion should return in roughly 10 minutes. <clears throat> Does the critic have a direct role to play in prodding us, the audience, into an awareness of the meaning of life. I have to read that again. Uh, does, does the critic have a direct role to play in prodding us, the audience, into an awareness of the meaning of life? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I quite grasped the second myself, but perhaps uh, Dr. Bentley will. If we do not go back historically to try to put ourselves into the minds of the Elizabethans, is it not possible that we will miss many great plays which have only lately superficially lost their meaning, and indeed many important interpretive aspects of accepted playwrights, such as Shakespeare. Oh. I think it concerns projecting yeah. self uh, that's <laughs> You know that uh, Gertrude Stein on her deathbed was supposed to have said, what is the answer? And then after another minute, she said, what is the question? <laughs> And I'm, this is where I am with my answer to this. Um, what's happening? If we do not go back historically to put ourselves into the minds of the Elizabethans, is it not possible that we will miss many great plays which have on a lately sufficient last no meaning? And indeed, many important interpretive aspects of accepted playwrights such as Shakespeare. I understand some of that and I, th I feel criticized for something where I perhaps should defend myself, and that is uh, what I said about historical scholarship. We should underline for dealing with the part of this question that I understand, we should underline the, that section of my remarks, which is about how I didn't wish to remove from historical scholarship a function far from it. And of course I recognize that, um, for example, a play might be brought to our attention through historical scholarship, of course. I was only talking about what a play finally means to anyone is not a historical matter mainly. Though what it signifies, uh, they may have seriously modified their views and their, uh, that is a historical reading and understanding may have modified their understanding of a play and so not only their brain, not only their cerebral response to it, but their emotional response to it as well. But I think that is preliminary uh, and ancillary, and that the main thing is still the soul trying to face its God. You know, that finally, after all the comment on the Bible, the Bible is there to do something more than present uh, historical lore. It's a direct message to you from whoever you think wrote the Bible. Uh, there follow a series of questions uh, that deal with the matter of vengeance, 
and forgiveness or mercy. Uh, the first of these relates the question really uh, to the work of art. Is the Christian consolation compatible with the notion of tragedy? Are they just two different forms of transcendence? Well, um, for me, uh, there are all kinds of answers to questions like this. For me, they are verbal questions, mostly, uh, semantical questions. It, it is, uh, for all I care, so to speak, you can define these terms how you wish and have it your own way, that is, as to whether it's no longer tragedy when you do thus and so. Now, as to what assumptions I myself was making, because obviously I was making some, I was making the assumption, yes, that when you have the consolation, whether you call it Christian or otherwise, as in Measure for Measure and the last plays of Shakespeare, I was making the assumption that this is not tragedy, and I was calling it tragicomedy. The terminolo different people use different terminology, as long as we all know what we mean, I think we're clear on that. The uh, next uh, two or three questions uh, do not specifically uh, relate to art, but uh, involve Dr. Bentley perhaps in psychology and ethics. Uh, this questioner writes, a rather perverse thought occurred to me. Persistent, determined forgiveness as the reaction to all actions is the most subtle revenge of all. <laughs> Do you know of any plays on this wicked theme? <laughs> Um, no, this is right, uh, of course. Uh, this is true that the, the, the speaking, as it were, I say you to whoever it was that wrote this, of the last temptation of the saint to be, to use uh, virtue. And I, of course, Eliot's murder in the cathedral uses that general point, or not on the specific point of punishment and forgiveness, but the point uh, of the the saint being tempted at the end by the very thought of these virtues is used there but quite dramatically, I think. I don't know of any instance in the drama of specifically what this questioner uh, states. I agree that it could be uh, wonderfully dramatic for someone like Strindberg, perhaps. It's quite modern, the wickedness of virtue, as it were. <coughs> The $100 fine for the theft of $100 is presumably an effort toward the true justice of restoring to one unjustly wronged. Eye for an eye makes no restoration, so is mere revenge. To lump these two concepts into one, when they are in truth opposites, seems a departure from your usual careful logic. Do you accept this point of difference? Um, well, I may accept it, but the Bible doesn't. And I was really just going on the lines of analyzing what the Lex Talionis was in the Old Testament. And you see, the restoration of 100 for 100 isn't a restoration to the original person, because the Lex Talionis demands it, even if the original person is not there anymore, even if he's dead. And, has no survivors. It's just that a hundred equals a hundred, and a hundred can only be replaced by a hundred, irrespective of all utility. I agree it would be quite different if it was a matter of you stolen my piano and I want it back and you give it to me. I agree that's very nice. That has nothing to do with the Lex Talionis. Uh, next, could you consider the instinct for self-preservation as underlying the expression of revenge and vengeance. May I read that? Could you consider the instinct for self-preservation as underlying the expression of revenge and vengeance? I could consider that it might, but I can't consider that stating it gives us a very full analysis of revenge and vengeance. I think those suggestions of Freud and Breuer, for instance, go much further in suggesting that the organism feels incomplete when it has been hit and hasn't released the whatever it is that the being hit does to you. And the assumption is made that releasing it upon the other person's nose is, is the, the thing to do. 
uh, and only by great discipline is it released into anything morally superior. Uh, that has to do partly with self-preservation, but I think less with basic self-preservation, which is a biological entity to keep alive, than with something more of civilization, which is more in the lines of keeping up your own end or re establishing your prestige. The whole, uh, the usual now middle class American idea about young people, that they have no dignity if they weren't vengeful because they'd be sissies and so on. This seems to me, that's not self-preservation, that's keeping the prestige of being the male male, etc. Uh, one last uh, general question of this kind, and then some of the others, I think, uh, return specifically uh, to some of the plays. Would the Gandhi-Martin Luther King concepts fit your view of non-revenge and at least approach forgiveness? Uh, yes, I thought that probably the phraseology I used would, uh, would uh, say that because it's phraseology taken from Gandhi of non-violent resistance and it's somehow clear, or at least became clearer to me in his life and work than it has been in Christian tradition generally that what the point I was trying to make is clearer there that it isn't just an expression of pure virtue in, in a natural way but that it is the taming of a very proud creature which Gandhi was if you read about the young Gandhi you will find he was no gentle person but an arrogant and aggressive person he had all those energies still as an old man he never declined as, as far as life force was concerned it, it was a work perhaps natural in some degree in a country that has yoga and so on that, that he would think of redirecting this fierce and hostile energy and making it only hostile to bad things and not to bad people a redirection of energy not an absence of it is very different from at least what uh, most of traditional Christianity seems to have been saying on this point and so definitely and now Martin Luther King is a Christian but nevertheless he's a Christian influ influence from outside Christianity namely by uh, Gandhi Why doesn't Hamlet ever consider his desire for uh, revenge sinful? Why doesn't Hamlet ever consider his desire for revenge sinful? <laughs> That's what I said, isn't it? Uh, why doesn't Hamlet ever consider his desire for revenge? Uh, I mean, that was what worried me as to why Shakespeare didn't say that more often. I think there are perhaps lines, or none are coming to my mind at this moment, where he is worried. No, it's really, I suppose, the, the scholars are right on this point, that the worry is less about, uh, well, that's, that, it's more complicated. If it would, were revenge, it would be sinful, but Hamlet can tell himself that it's not revenge because he is the instrument of God. Certainly he is if the ghost is right, and therefore the discussion is often, as in Dover Wilson's book, what happened in Hamlet, of whether what we get in Hamlet isn't his wondering whether the ghost was in fact from God which makes the revenge not revenge but divine retribution or from the devil in which case it would be revenge and which would which would be sinful those seem to be the terms in which Shakespeare stated it therefore he has nothing to say to those of us who ask this question a question so to speak of fact marked casting with an exclamation point. What ages should the daughters of Lear be? Goneril, Regan, Cordelia. Lear's age, question mark. <laughs> Good heavens. <laughs> what age should the daughters of Lear be? I, from an ethical standpoint? Uh, uh, no, I think <laughs> practically. <laughs> uh, I never thought of that, and I'd never gone through the text looking for any hints that it might have. I don't know if it has any. Professor Phillips would undoubtedly know a lot better than I would whether the text contains any suggestions on this point. I'm afraid that I have none except possibly to comment on the further query here, Lear's age. 
Oh, but wait a minute, this is casting. I'm a little better on that than on Shakespeare's scholarship. He means what ages should the actresses, actresses be? Yep. be? Well, I'll tell you that. Cordelia should be 19, Regan should be 25, and Goneril should be 27, or vice versa. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as to Goneril and Regan, vice versa. Uh, Lear should be... Uh, from the modern point of view, uh, old looking, therefore people will assume that he's about 70, but he's really about 50. <laughs> in your statement that transcendence in Lear comes through the act of writing the play, how is this uh, evidenced in the play? It couldn't be. You offer me a logical impossibility. If the play is the evidence as a whole, its parts couldn't be the evidence. Uh, no, but I meant something very simple that's it, not necessarily true, but it is clear, and that is uh, that the fact, put it even more simply than I did, if a man is close to complete uh, defeat and downfall, and he writes anything, even a bad play, that was, at least for the moment, a triumph over this. Uh, for instance, take poets who have committed suicide, such as Kleist. He didn't commit suicide uh, upon writing the uh, Prince of Homburg. The Prince of Homburg established a victory over his suicidal wishes for the time being. It wasn't permanent. So I'm saying any work of art if it deals with uh, this existential despair of the author, contradicts that despair and says, oh, oh, but you weren't as despairing as all that, or you couldn't have put pen to paper. I was making a statement as simple as that. I mean, real despair, when it's complete, produces uh, physical illness, psychotic illness, or suicide. Those are the only three possibilities, as far as I can see, if it's complete, but if it's if you have any remaining powers, you may do something. I'm suggesting that Shakespeare wrote King Lear. So that to be able to write it out of what is confessed in it is a tremendous triumph of the human will and uh, imagination. I meant it that way. Now, I can't prove it. It isn't a provable proposition. You may think it's quite untrue, but neither can is it possible even if true, that I should provide evidence for it, unless the evidence is just that the play is that kind of, that is what the play is about, that is the play does express, um, it does come out of facing the ultimate horrors and having felt despair over them, or well, not to the extent of not being able to write King Lear, which might have happened. <coughs> The uh, next questioner submits two questions, the second of which it seems to me uh, Dr. Bentley has just now answered. The question, isn't song the expression of despair as distinct from the transcendence of it? I would say that you had just responded to that question here. The other... I also go back to, to my say, isn't song the expression of despair rather than the transcendence of it? There's no reason why it shouldn't be both. Of course, if, it's, if the song is a good song, I'm not talk talking about somebody in despair who sings somebody else's song, I'm talking about somebody who creates a song, like Shakespeare. Out of despair, it will express despair to, uh, to the extent that it's a good work of art that is expressed. And the question of expression, then, is the question of its merit. Is it any good as a poem on despair? If it is, it has expressed despair. If it is not, it does not express despair. But even if it is not, the despair, if felt, where we wouldn't know whether it would be felt or not if it wasn't expressed, has been transcended in the work. You see how different those two things are. See, it's only through the, the despair being expressed that you know it's there at all. <laughs> the other questioner, or the other question submitted, have we the right to assume, as you have suggested, that the terror of Lear was recalled and set down in tranquility? Um, 
it was, a, I said vertigo and tranquility as a joke. Of course, I won't quote that as an alibi. A joke should be true. Uh, tranquility is relative. Of course, I, I wasn't uh, claiming to enter into Shakespeare's life and, and to have noted that on the days when he was writing King Lear, a peculiarly serene expression was on his countenance. I have no idea about anything of that sort, naturally. Uh, but I do have as a, perhaps a general prejudice or view about art, though certain things partially contradict this, that it is by definition written in tranquility and that the instances of the contrary are not too convincing as instances of the contrary when you go into them. As people talk about writing in a passion, well, you can write a few lines in a passion, but no passion ever lasts through five acts, not that kind of a passion. And it seems to me that any work of art expressing great passion, Wordsworth's The Prelude, uh, Shakespeare's plays, Milton's Paradise Lost, these big works must have been written largely in what we call tranquility, meaning by that the relative repose, or it may not be a complete repose, which is after the experience is expressed not during them. He doesn't write Romeo and Juliet while he's in bed with Juliet, you see is what I mean. And neither does he write suicidal thoughts while he's holding the knife in the air, wondering whether to plunge it in. That's all. It's a t it might be roughly uh, at the same time, but s essentially they're not, if you see what I mean. Essentially in time those things are separated. So I think as a generalization it's a reasonable one. <clears throat> the uh, concluding questions raise uh, such very large issues, and uh, since we're roughly two hours from beginning, I think uh, Dr. Bentley may want to reply to these briefly. The first, please enlarge on changing fashions in Shakespeare popularity, that is, the popularity of Lear today, Macbeth yesterday, Hamlet the day before. Yes, I, th I think that's a very relevant point, and that I, I hope it was suggested by the opening part of my talk, the part about the growing, how Shakespeare's works, like any great works, move and grow and shape themselves in time. This makes the changing judgments not just a matter of snobbery, accident, fadism, and so on, but representing possibly deeper changes in history. We're talking this afternoon in Dean Melnitz's seminar, as a matter of fact, about an instance of this, the fact that Hamlet is the great Shakespearean play for most articulate people in the 19th century. Most people have told us their views. It's almost taken for granted that this is uh, the great Shakespearean play. If you're only going to talk about one Shakespeare, you talk about Hamlet. I think this is still assumed in Freud, who's a, a product of that century. Uh, from his point of view, Hamlet was the Shakespearean play. He sums up a hundred years in that. And now, today, it's King Lear, as it seems so. It seems so in the last 10 or 15 years. It seems as if King Lear. This is legitimate because I think that Hamlet was the 19th century play, most, and that King Lear seems to be, for us, more a vision of our uh, problems, uh, difficulties, and our, se our vision of, of what the obstacles are. It says more to us than Hamlet, I believe. We could almost at moments see Hamlet as trivial, though heaven knows it isn't really, but one could, I could easily get myself in a frame of mind where I feel that way, not so easily the other way around. This is a legitimate, uh, here are these great works, and some of them say more to one time and some more to another. <coughs> We pass away from Shakespeare, just in conclusion here, to others on whom uh, Dr. Bentley has written with authority. Why did Shaw hate Shakespeare? Just jealousy? <laughs> well, uh, Shaw didn't hate Shakespeare, and uh, there is a whole collection that one younger scholar has made that's very convincing. It's called Shaw on Shakespeare. It's a collection of several hundred pages of Shaw and Shakespeare with no mean, with no omissions meant to uh, prejudice the case, uh, showing that Shaw was a very generous appreciator of Shakespeare's greatness, 
while at the same time having found in Shakespeare production in the 90s the chief obstacle to the production of his own plays and also something that was stale and sterile in the theater, Shakespearean production of that period. He was also an Irishman and a man who teased and a man who exaggerated and a man who liked to have people saying that he'd professed to be better than Shakespeare when in all the length and breadth of his works you cannot find that statement. <coughs> I conclude uh, with two questions which I think uh, can actually be related. Uh, the first, who in the contemporary drama measures up to the stature of Shakespeare, or at least half his stature, or at least an iota of his stature? The other, since your scholarli the scholarliness is associated with Brecht, could you speak of his place in the world theater of today and tomorrow? Does he not represent a kind of Shakespeare of our day? Well, um, I resist the first question because it seems to ask for a kind of grading of giving dramatists A plus and A minus and, and B plus and, and so on. I think there's, there can be no exact measuring of this. One reason why we estimate Shakespeare so highly in relation to foreign playwrights may be that we understand the foreign ones less. I certainly understand Sophocles much less, uh, and so I may not, uh, not that I would state dogmatically that he's inferior to Shakespeare, but he would always mean less, because one's intim the intimacy of one's relation uh, to Shakespeare can be greater through one's better understanding of the English language, since Shakespeare is language, and Sophocles is language, but another language. So I, that's all I would care to say on that point. Now, as to whether modern playwrights come along whom one should describe as another Shakespeare, loosely one might, but it might also be wise to not do that, whether it's Shaw or Brecht or Ibsen, or Strindberg, Shaw called Strindberg Shakespearean once, meaning that he had an immense emotional range, I think, and power. But on the whole, it's uh, an accolade that's inaccurate and perhaps unfair to the gifts that these men have. That is, uh, these men are probably not as great as Shakespeare, any of them. But why make this point? I mean, what's the point of this point? Of, of taking the leading playwrights of the time and observing that somebody else was better, we're getting back to the mocking system again. We might ponder the what may be the peculiar greatness of Shakespeare, because I often think in teaching the drama that, at least for those whose language is English, that Shakespeare is half of the subject and all the other playwrights, now I'm measuring, all the other playwrights are the other half, we might uh, ponder what that magnitude that we attribute to him means. It's clearly not the number of plays, and yet quantity has something to do with it, because we wouldn't think so highly of him if he hadn't written the comedies and the tragedies and, and so on. What does the magnitude mean? And would, could we in any way measure it against the greatest that we know in some other line? whether the other line be another line of poetry, like Dante, or whether it be, uh, say, uh, the greatness of spirit in another art, in, in Beethoven uh, or in Michelangelo. Um, well, there, too, one is not going to be able to measure, but I, I think that speculation is both uh, fascinating and possibly will illuminate some of the, some of the truth. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bentley, for the lecture and for your generous answering of these questions. Good night. Thank you.